Hello, hi, I'm Michal and uh, David. We are both engineers on the RabbitMQ team. Uh, we will be talking about uh, RabbitMQ performance in general, but that means basically how, Erdang, uh, sorry, so how RabbitMQ is built on top of Erdang and also how we measure things and how we improve things and some of the improvements we, we have already made. After Lucas's presentation and uh, Gabor's presentation, I think we could probably turn that into more of an exam. You should probably already know all of that. Uh, so we'll see how it goes. And uh, over to David. Yeah. Um, let's get started. So this is the agenda for today. Before we um, jump directly to RapidMQ performance improvements, we need to get a basic understanding of how RapidMQ's design looks like, how it's implemented today. And since RapidMQ is implemented in Erlang, you also need to get a basic understanding, high level, about the Erlang programming paradigms. So basically, yeah, covers part of what uh, Lucas already explained in the keynote. We were actually thinking about um, changing some slides <laughs> in a few hours, but the concepts are so important, I think it's worth to recap um, the first 10 minutes again. Um, yeah, so let's start with Erlang programming paradigms. So in Erlang, um, everything is an actor. So an actor in Erlang corresponds to an object in an object-oriented programming language. Um, every actor has a state, so the state is internal to each actor. That is, um, the state is not shared with other actors. So in this case, um, this actor here just has a counter initialized to zero. Now, actors are reactive. They react on incoming messages. So every actor has a mailbox, and when it um, processes a message, it can do a few different things. So for example, it could change its internal state. It could send a message to another actor, uh, the same message or a different message, or it can create new actors. Now every actor is an Erlang process, and Erlang processes are very lightweight. So an Erlang process is much more lightweight compared, of course, to an operating system process and also uh, to Java threads. An Erlang uh, process can be maybe compared to a Go routine in, uh, in Go. So because they are so lightweight, we can have many of them. So we can have hundreds of thousands or even millions of um, actors. And so every actor is independent of other actors. And um, yeah, they do not share any state. And the only way to interact between processes is through message passing. So Erlang has no uh, mutexes, no synchronized methods, and none of the uh, complicated, slow, and error-prone mechanics of shared memory programming. So and all this achieves concurrency. And concurrency is the composition of independently executing computation. So it's about the structure. And with concurrency, we get a few benefits. So the first benefit is uh, scalability. So we said that creating and destroying actors very fast. This means that if system load increases, we can just increase the number of actors. We also get um, better performance because of concurrency. So parallelism, um, because it can run all the actors on different CPUs in parallel, as we saw uh, this morning. So this means if you have written an Erlang program 10 years ago, and today um, you use a machine with more CPUs, it gets a nice speed up because it already is structured uh, nicely and concurrently. Now, an Erlang application consists of a supervision tree, um, the upper processes, um, they supervise uh, or monitor the lower processes, and the lower processes are called the workers. And they restart them if they crash. So this means um, that yeah, if one worker crashes, the supervisor will just lock a message and restart it. So um, those errors are local to a uh, process. So if, an, if there's an error in an Erlang process, it doesn't take down the whole system. And this um, gives us fault tolerance. Now, um, Right. Yeah, um, Erlang OTP implements the actor model. So built in Erlang runtime characteristics are scalability, performance, fault tolerance, and clarity. So clarity in the sense of clear and easy to understand code. Um, yeah, OTP is the open telecom platform. It's a set of libraries. It provides um, generic behaviors. Um, so the most common one is the gen server. So a generic server. And the generic behaviors implement the common abstractions, so the code which is common across all uh, Erlang applications. They implement the non-functional parts, that is a fault tolerance and scalability. Then a specific Erlang application implements so-called uh, callbacks, so they implement um, the actual logic, so uh, what happens if uh, a server, for example, receives a message. 
Now, to do one simple example, uh, just that you have seen some Erlang code. Um, so let's say we want to implement a server that receives um, a message that increments a counter. So this is more or less how it, was, how it would look like. So we declare a module name. The module name is kind of a class. So the module is the class. The process is the uh, object, if you want so. And then we say that uh, behavior gen server. So we implement a gen server. And then we just implement the callback functions. So the callback functions um, must be implemented. Um, and they are uh, defined by the uh, gen server behavior. So in this case, it's just an init function, um, which is called when the process starts. And we just return the initial state. So that's the state which is private to each actor. Here it's just uh, OK0. Zero. So 0 is the state, just a counter. And then when we uh, receive a message, the handle cast callback is called. So the first argument is um, the message being received. So this comes from some client. In this case, it's a request increment. Then we get the state, our own state of the actor, and we just return by incrementing that state. So this is basically how Erlang applications work. Now let's come to RabbitMQ architecture. So RabbitMQ, as you know, it implements the MQP 0.9.1 protocol. And the MQP 0.9.1 protocol defines um, yeah, the interface between the protocol between client and server, but also the uh, server objects. So we have MQs, exchanges, and bindings. So a publisher sends a message to an exchange, gets routed depending on the routing keys to a queue, where the message is stored until it's consumed by a consumer. Now, the thing is we can have multiple um, exchanges, queues, bindings, and multiple client connections. So there are some customers which um, have more than hundreds of thousands of exchanges, bindings, and queues, and client connections. The requirement here is that RabbitMQ needs to scale with a number of client connections, exchanges, queues, and bindings. And this is how RabbitMQ implements the protocol. So basically, um, we have a connection reader, which reads the MQP protocol frames, that so understands the frames. It then sends a message to a channel. So the channel is another MQP concept. It's a virtual connection. So channels share the same socket. The channel then sends um, the message via exchanges and bindings to a queue. And on the consumption part, the uh, queue sends the message to a channel, which forwards it to the connection writer, and then uh, writes it to the consumer. And all, well, connection processes, channels, and queues are implemented as actors, as Erlang processes. And most of them are also implemented as a gen server, so exactly the example you saw, you saw earlier on. So to give an example um, how the channel is implemented, so the channel receives a message from the connection reader. It then, for example, um, stores the sequence number of the message in its internal state. It then sends the message to the queue. The queue stores it, and the actor in the channel just beans back, chills, waits for a confirmation from the queue to come back that it successfully received the message. And so this is the publisher confirmation. And the publisher confirmation is then sent from the channel um, via the connection process back to the publisher. So this is how it's implemented, basically. Now, exchanges and bindings, they are just um, entries in a database, so in Venezia, which is Erlang's distributed um, database. So in theory, you could also probably implement um, yeah, exchanges as actors, but they are rather static, so their state doesn't really change. So it's even better and cheaper to have them just um, entries uh, in the database. Right, and the key takeaway here is that because connections channels and queues are implemented as actors, as Erlang processes. RabbitMQ as a message broker provides scalability, performance, and fault tolerance out of the box. And we just get it for free because it's implemented in Erlang and runs on the Beam virtual machine. Now, does it mean we achieve linear scalability? So you might see performance issues, high latency, takes some time to process the message until the publisher confirmation comes back, for example or you don't achieve the message throughput that um, you're, you're hoping for. In that case, we need to find the bottleneck. So could be in the network, rarely, but could be. And most often, it's in RabbitMQ. And then we need to figure out which actor is causing that bottleneck. Right, often, not always, but often, um, the queue becomes a bottleneck. And this is because the queue does the heavy work. So it writes messages to um, the disk if the messages are persistent. Or if it's a replicated queue, 
it replicates the messages to other RabbitMQ nodes. So this, um, of course, takes a bit longer than what channel and connection processes are doing. So in general, therefore, it's um, yeah, an anti-pattern to have a single queue. So if all your publisher connections write to a single queue, that's very bad. So your single queue will be um, the bottleneck. And also, as um, yeah, Andrew already explained in his talk, uh, Bloomberg talk today, we need to do some sharding so that we have um, yeah, distribute the messages across multiple queues. So ideally, your client connections define multiple queues. Um, if that's not possible, you can also use the sharding plugin or the consistent hash exchange plugin, which ships uh, with RabbitMQ. And this um, yeah, provides better sharding. And also new queue types have been developed. So quorum queues, we will um, hear a keynote later on. Um, so they were designed for better data safety, but also they replicate faster than classic mirror queues because classic mirror queues do the chain algorithm. So they uh, send the message to every uh, mirror once in a chain. And this is much slower than what quorum queues do. So they send a message to um, their followers. And once they receive response from the majority of nodes, the message can be uh, confirmed. Also streams um, provide much better throughput than classic queues because um, Streams are implemented as a um, immutable um, append-only disk lock. Then another option, which is um, not available today, um, maybe it makes sense to have uh, no queue at all. So for example, let's say you don't care about persistence. You don't care about your messages being replicated. So maybe it makes sense if you send your messages directly from um, your connection process of the publisher to any online subscribers or any online consumer to the connection process of the consumer directly. So it's something to think about. Right. Um, so RabbitMQ uh, can be very slow and very fast. Depends on when you look at it. So that's Schrodinger's rabbit. Um, but yeah, so what we mean here is that RabbitMQ can change its behavior if you change the input just a little bit. For example, if you change only the message size, it can behave completely different um, regarding performance. So for example, it makes also a big difference if you have a single connection publishing 10,000 messages per second versus 10,000 uh, connections each publishing one message per second. So in the end, you have the same number of messages in the queue, but completely different scenario because in the second scenario, you have uh, 10,000 connection processes, 10,000 uh, channels, and also from the uh, queue perspective, it's totally different performance. So therefore, it's important then uh, that if you report any performance issues, or if you see performance issues, um, to provide as much details as possible, and ideally even a way to generate the workload. And yeah, this leads us to performance tools. Yeah, maybe just one small clarification, if it wasn't clear, the one queue anti-pattern. Basically, when a queue is one process, Lucas explained how processes can move between CPUs, but a queue is one process. It doesn't matter how many CPUs you have because it will only, only execute on one of them at a given time. And even then, it will not take the whole time of the CPU. But uh, yeah, that's why like, if, you, if a problem is with a single queue, more CPUs almost certainly won't help you. All right, so how do we work on RabbitMQ performance? Um, first of all, we need a way to generate some load some workload. Ideally, um, when you report issues, if you could provide that for us, that's great. If you can at least describe what you do, then we can try to use our tools to uh, mimic what you're doing uh, to see whether we can reproduce the problem that uh, someone is talking about. For that, we use PerfTest that Gabor was talking about. That's our main testing tool. It has a lot of different options. You can uh, simulate a given number of connections, channels, publishing connections, consuming connections, different queue types, different exchange types, um, a lot of options. Um, it's a very complex tool under the hood, um, but it gives us a way to basically reproduce any, any workload we want. That also gives you the way to uh, reproduce the workload to run that on your test environment. If you suspect an issue, a bug in RabbitMQ, for example, you can try to use PerfTest and perform something similar to what your application does and see whether you can reproduce the same problem. If not, the chances are it's the problem of the application, what it does, uh, if, if PerfTest cannot you know, trigger the same behavior. 
Uh, there is a similar tool called StreamPerfTest, which conceptually does the same thing, but uses the stream protocol. So you can uh, generate uh, load uh, for RabbitMQ streams. Again, different number of publishers, consumers, streams, message sizes, message rates, and so on. And lastly, EMQTT Bench. Uh, that's a tool that uh, not our team maintains, but we also use it for reproducing MQTT uh, workloads. Conceptually, again, the same, the same idea, just simulate a number of connections doing different things. Once we have RabbitMQ under a certain workload, we need to observe how it behaves. Uh, there are a number of tools for that. The most obvious one is simply monitoring. You know, we have Prometheus plugin, we have Grafana dashboards, and that's step one. Um, other than that, there is a microstate accounting, which is, which is an Erlang mechanism for um, high-level overview of what the Erlang virtual machine, where it spends the time, right? Is it actually executing code, or maybe performing memory allocations, or maybe, maybe performing ETS operations? that gives some idea of, of where the problem is. Most commonly, with working with Rabbit, the most common situation I see is something is slow, and we check with microstate accounting, and according to that, most of the schedulers are idle almost all the time, right? And then, you know, the problem is fairly obvious that there must be some kind of a locking, some kind of locking something is waiting for something else, um, or some potentially waiting for disk operations, then that, that would be visible in a different column. But the, 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 the most interesting one called emulator there tells us how much time is actually spent executing code. And if that's a very small number, then you know, that gives us an idea of where to look for the problem. Then there is a CPROF, EPROF, and FPROF. These are Erlang specific profilers uh, that give you a code level overview of uh, what, uh, again, the Erlang virtual machine is busy with. Uh, CProf gives you a counter of how many times a given function was executed. Uh, EProf gives you that counter plus uh, how much time was spent executing that function, but without a stack trace, so we don't know which function executed that function, but we know that in total that function spent uh, so much time. And then FProf, which is the most, has the highest overhead, but provides the full uh, call graph showing you which function called which other function, which other function, and how much time that uh, was spent in those functions. Lastly, RabbitMQ Diag Diagnostics Observer. Observer is actually a completely separate tool, but we ship it together with Rabbit so to make it easy uh, to use it in a Rabbit environment. So if you just run RabbitMQ Diagnostic Observer in any, on any server where you are running RabbitMQ, you will see a view similar to this one. This uh, part particular screenshot already shows a problem that I will be talking about in a moment. Uh, but that, that gives you an overview of what processes are running. You can sort them by uh, the message queue length. So this is how many Erlang messages this process uh, should process uh, or are waiting for that process to execute on. Uh, you can sort by memory used by a given process. You can sort by reductions that Lucas mentioned. That's roughly gives you an idea of the amount of work it, it, the reductions number doesn't tell you anything, like what well, does it mean that you know, 400 million reductions were performed? But relative to other numbers, you get an idea, okay, this process you know, performed 10 times more work than all the other processes combined. You know, again, it's pretty obvious where to look for the problem at least. All right. Lastly, um, Erlang, 20, <coughs> Erlang 24 added a just-in-time just compiler which makes it, makes it possible to use it with perf. And perf is a Linux specific profiler that works. It is not Erlang specific, it's a Linux tool that now also works with Erlang, let's say. Um, and that gives you an overview of what the CPUs were executing during the sampling period when perf was running. So basically you can monitor RabbitMQ or you can monitor other applications or you can monitor the whole system and see why was your system busy down to the functions uh, executed inside RabbitMQ? There is some initial setup if you want to use perf. I would highly recommend you to go through this setup and have it ready so that if you hit any issues in Rabbit, you can record that. The overhead of perf is very small. 
it's perfectly okay to run it for 10, 30 seconds, which is usually enough. If you run it, for example, uh, during the issue when it happens, and then later when there is no problem, the idea, the, the, the option for us to compare what was being executed in one case and the other gives us a good uh, idea of where the, pro where the problem can be. Other than installing a bunch of tools, we need to run RabdMQ with an additional environment variable uh, that basically writes to disk the debug symbols for Erlang functions so that we can see not memory addresses in the report, but actual function names. And then if you actually want to sample, that's what we do very often now, perf record, and basically at the end of 30, that means 30 seconds, so we just record what the Erlang virtual machine is doing for 30 seconds in this case, and we generate a nice view called a flame graph that gives, you, gives us a visualization of the data. There's a lot of data, so some form of visualization is necessary to understand it. At first, maybe it's a bit confusing, but it's actually fairly simple. Uh, the colors don't mean anything. They are here just to justify the name flame graph, so everything is cool. Uh, the height, the y-axis, doesn't really matter. That's, the, uh, that's how deep the stack trace is, basically, but especially in a functional language, it's perfectly normal that some stack, trace, stack traces will be fairly deep. The most important bit is the width of a given box. So, for example, on this particular frame graph, we see that the rabbit channel handle cast function, which is you know, from here to here, compared to the whole width of the graph, which is 100% of what the CPUs were performing, that's, let's say, 50%, right? So we know that roughly 50% of those 30 seconds, CPUs were executing the handle cast in the rabbit channel module. And then we can go uh, up from that, and we see that the rabbit channel executed the handle method, and that executed rabbit channel deliver to queues. So you can see that name here, and the rabbit queue type, and so on and so forth. And this is an in interactive uh, SVG file, so we can actually zoom in and see all those names and all those details and things that right now on, in this view are just impossible to see. You can actually see them easily uh, when, you see, when you think that it's worth investigating. Like in this case, you know, investigating this area certainly makes sense if you want to improve something. You know, investigating something like this probably doesn't make any sense because you know, you optimize something that is already very fast. All right, using these tools, we performed a lot of optimizations already, and we are obviously planning to do more. Um, this is the same graph again, flame graph again. Um, one thing that you can notice here is that rabbit, rabbit exchange root function uh, is executed uh, very often, and uh, the CPU spends a lot of time there. You can see here it's actually almost 10% of the time is spent rooting. In some cases, maybe that there would be a justification for that, but in this case, we are talking about an environment which, where there is one queue with one binding, and the goal of the routing is to decide where, which queue the message should, should be delivered to, and when there is just one queue with one binding, that should be very fast, right? So something is wrong here. <clears throat> so if we zoom in, we can see that this rabbit exchange root function actually executes rabbit amq queue lookup and also rabbit exchange root, which calls rabbit router, find roots, and so on, and we see ETS operations, db select operations, db match compile operations. And for us, you know, as a RabbitMQ user uh, or even operator, probably that at this point you have no idea what's going on. But if you can share something like that with us and you say, we, I have a problem and you share a flame graph that you recorded, for us that's, you know, that's very valuable information because we know where the problem can be. In this case, the ETS select operation, that the db match compile tells us that even though there is only one record in the routing table, we spend a lot of time looking for that one record. Most importantly, because we perform this compilation, you can, if you, are, if you ever programmed with uh, regular expressions, for example, you may be familiar with that. You write it in a certain, you know, human-friendly, if you can call regular expressions, expressions human-friendly uh, language, and then you compile it for the computer to actually be able to 
match a regular expression to a string efficiently. And here there is the same idea, right? So you, we write a query and that query needs to be compiled so that then it can be compared. And the comparison will be very fast because there's only one thing to compare it with. But the compilation takes a long time. To explain how we solve that, we need to understand how we actually store the routing information. We still store it this way because certain routing patterns uh, like topic exchanges and uh, fan out require this kind of structure, or maybe we'll change that in the future, but at least for this particular case, we focus on the direct exchange, and we call the direct exchange routing version two. So specifically, this optimization only will help you with um, uh, direct routing. So once again, it's very important to remember that whenever you report a problem or you're investigating an issue, all details matter, right? Like this will give you a great improvement, but only if you use direct exchange. If you use anything, if you use anything else, it's just not applicable, right? Just like message size, just like other things, the exchange type also plays a significant role. All right, so what happens here? That's basically a table. We can think about that more or less as a key value store or a, you know, a SQL table, whatever you're familiar with. But the problem here is that in one column, we store all this information. That's basically the binding. The first part is the source. So the exchange code direct in the default vhost with this routing key, uh, the messages should be routed to the default vhost queue called my stream. So basically the key and the value we are looking for, for the routing purposes is here just joined together in a single column, right? Because ultimately our job is based on where the message came from, which exchange, and what the routing key was, we want to find the destination. But here we store everything together, so we cannot just perform a key-based lookup. We need to perform a full table scan, basically. So the solution was, actually, uh, one thing I forgot. Um, this is actually explicitly mentioned in the documentation, in the Erlang documentation, that you should not do what we are doing here, right? Which is great because we are not doing that anymore. We basically introduced an additional ETS table where we separated the key from the value, right? So now we have this column which only con contains the information that we consider the key. Where is the message coming from and what is the routing key? And the value is where should this message be routed, right? So now we can perform an ETS lookup element uh, function, which is much faster. And uh, the result of these improvements is that under the same workload, now this function, it used to be almost 10%, now it's 2.5%, right? And if we look at this in terms of throughput, that means 10 to 40% uh, improvement in throughput Again, in very specific cases, right? If you publish a lot of messages through a direct exchange and there are no other bottlenecks, but your routing could be a bottleneck, then this should help you quite a bit. If you're in any other scenario, it will probably not help you at all or very little. This particular improvement will ship in RabbitMQ 3.11. Uh, unfortunately, it requires a feature flag and all nodes to agree that this mechanism will be used uh, and therefore we could not ship that in a, in a patch release, but in 3.11 routing, direct routing will be faster. All right, case study number two. Uh, the same uh, RabbitMQ observer screenshot that we saw before. Uh, the highlighted part is the problem. We can see there is uh, over 700 uh, 700,000 messages in the queue, in the mailbox of the RALOG meta process. RALOG meta is part of the RA subsystem that basically stores in metadata or meta information about the log uh, for quorum queues, for example. The fact that, well, the fact that so many messages accumulated in the, in the mailbox is a clear sign that this process cannot keep up with the demand, right? Like other processes are asking this process to do something, but it cannot do it fast enough. So more and more uh, requests to do something are accumulating in the mailbox. Ultimately, because the Erlang mailboxes are not limited in size, if we just keep writing like that, we will just run out of memory at some point, right? All those messages are uh, kept in memory waiting to be processed. They are not processed fast enough. There's more and more of them. 
at some point, sooner or later, we run out of memory. In this particular case, once I found the per combination of perf test flags to trigger this issue, on my machine with 32 gigs of RAM, it was literally you know, running at full speed, of course. Hopefully, you're not you know, running your rabbit at full speed and just pushing messages as fast as possible. But in this case, it was literally just a, a matter of a few minutes, and that's it. 32 gigabytes of memory gone, right? Or actually, less than that. But basically, the Linux, would, uh, Linux uh, kernel would uh, perform such so-called uh, out-of-memory kill. All right, what can we do with that? Once again, we perform a perf sample, a capture, and we generate a flame graph. When I saw this flame graph for the first time, it was the first, <laughs> it was the most, I think, until then, like, I've never seen a more obvious flame graph. Like, where is the issue here? Well, <laughs> it's here. <laughs> um, so, DETS lookup operation that then calls DETS uh, request, I guess that's an abbreviation for a request. Um, from Ralog Meta module, that, that much we knew already. <clears throat> DETS is a, an Erlang mechanism to store information in a file on disk, basically, right? So we, we, we know we perform some, uh, some writes to disk here. That's the whole idea of the Ralog Meta process. It, it needs to save some metadata on disk. Um, first time when we, when we saw that, we, when we saw the issue and the long, uh, long mailbox, the initial thought was, well, it clearly cannot write to disk fast enough, right? Because, well, basically that's what this process does. It writes stuff to disk and cannot keep up, and therefore the writes must be slow. Well, on this flame graph, you already see actually the ETS lookup is slow, which we did not expect, because lookup means we are reading something from, uh, from the ETS. So something that we saved to disk and we are now reading. So the whole change to fix this problem was literally a one-line change, or you could even say, almost a one letter change in the code, right? We had this information memory in an ETS table and we stored it to disk and in one place in the code, we kind of forgot that we already have it in memory and we read it from that file, right? So we just kept reading this information from disk even though we already had it in memory. So just looking up for that, mem uh, for that information in an ETS table instead of a DTS file, the ETS file, let's say, under the same workload, Ralog wall, uh, Ralog Meta, sorry, actually, I highlighted the wrong process here. Uh, Ralog Meta has uh, 26 messages in the mailbox. Everything is running nice. You know, no, no risk of running out of memory. That was the, the perfect scenario, I would say, the, the happiest possible situation, right? The flame graph was clear where the problem is, and the problem turned out to be literally like one, one line change. Um, unfortunately, not. It's usually not <laughs> like that, not so easy. All right. Uh, with this process of generating different workloads, you know, looking for different situations, what happens when we establish a lot of connections? What happens when we publish a lot of messages? What happens if there are no consumers and we publish to disk, but you know, no one is consuming? That's a very different work workload, for example whether you have consumers or you have no consumers, right? In terms of what Rabbit needs to do and where the bottlenecks will be, pretty much completely different scenario just based on whether the consumer is currently online or not and whether it can keep up with the, uh, with the incoming messages. All those optimizations lead to hopefully more and more performant Rabbit and more and more uh, stable performance. Here is an example of, again, a very specific workload, but you know, under this workload, we expect Rabbit to handle 25,000 messages a second. There's uh, basically five publishers, each publishing 5,000 messages a second to five different quorum queues. That's the scenario here. And you can see that uh, this part is RabbitMQ 3.9. It kind of was able to handle that, but struggled. Like just by you know, the shape of this line, you can see that Yes, roughly 25,000 on average, yes, but it struggled. And then we perform an upgrade to 3.10, and under the same workload, you know, the same perf test is still running, immediately we can see a nice flat line because Rabbit has no problem uh, handling this workload anymore. Another comparison, uh, another workload, the details are you know, important, it's a quorum queue, 
uh, quorum queue scenario. But basically, the idea is to show how we do over time. The blue line is 3.9, and an uh, uh, important point here, some uh, performance improvements uh, are easy to backport, and when we, even if we, don't, if we notice them in our you know, main branch, if we can improve something and backport that to 3.10, 3.9, we'll do that. So if we compare latest 3.9 with 3.11 or something like that, we are actually comparing only the performance improvements that we could not backport for some reason, right? If we really want to compare how we did since 3.9 was released, we need to take 3.9.0 because otherwise we are already including some improvements uh, in the baseline, let's say. But in this case, this, is the, this was the latest 3.9 during the test. The blue line, roughly you know, 38,000 messages a second. Uh, this is a scenario where we have two producers and five consumers, and the consumers can keep up with publishers, right? So the queues are empty, and we just mess, thousands of messages are flowing through the queue, right? So 3.9 was able to do like 38,000 messages a second. 3.10, that was a ma major improvement internally. We actually call them Quorum Queues version 2, but you don't need to worry about that. You, when you upgrade, you just, you just get them. There's no special steps or anything like that. Um, that was a major improvement, many, many changes. So we increased the throughput that we can handle in this particular scenario from 38 to 47,000 messages a second. And then 3.11 can do almost 51,000 messages, quite likely because of those routing improvements, by the way. We are not sure. We didn't bother to you know, check every single uh, change that we've made since then to, to see exactly where this comes from, but quite likely from the routing improvements. All right. Yet another improvement that we are working on. Uh, in 3.10, we shipped the first part, let's say, of Classic Queues version 2. Basically, for the last year and a half, uh, Loic from our team was rewriting uh, Classic Queues to what we refer to as Classic Queues version 2. Uh, in 3.10, the first part of that was shipped. You still need to opt in. You need to specify the X queue version flag equals 2 and then you will use that mechanism. At some point, we will switch that so that it is used by default. Maybe in the same version, we will also automatically convert all your existing version one queues to version two. The details of how will that roll out, that uh, changes are not set in stone at this point, but you can already opt in to some of these benefits and in the upcoming uh, versions, you will see more and more. And ultimately, that will be the only queue version uh, good news here, the migration is perfectly smooth. Basically, you start a version 2 process and it is able to rewrite the on-disk representation of version 1 into version 2. So there is, again, no special steps that you need to perform other than wait a moment until uh, this, is, this process is finished. And as always, if your queues are fairly short, and they should be, that should be pretty quick. Um, yet another workload, but again, the important part in this case, we are using 12-byte messages, the perf test default. Not very realistic, but also very useful to, to use. Uh, green line is the version 1. You can see that uh, these lines, uh, I forgot to mention. I, in this case, I'm adding more and more queues. So each queue has, a, um, we are publishing 100 messages a second to a queue. And then we are adding another queue, another publisher and consumer, and 100 messages for that second queue. So now we have a total of 200 in two queues. And every 10 minutes, I add, uh, maybe it was five minutes, every now and then I add one more queue and see how that changes the situation, right? So up to 25 queues in this case, I kept this test running and added more and more, and we found other issues later, but just fo focusing on this first, first part, uh, version one, you know, from the, from the start there were some spikes, we are still talking, you know, the whole graph is 20 something milliseconds, so we're not talking about any, any important issues at this point really. But you can already see that version two can offer much more stable, first of all, like half the latency, but also much more stable. These lines are basically flat, right? And even when we start seeing some fluctuations, that's like one millisecond difference, right? That's it. Um, the second benefit of classic queues version two is much more predictable memory usage, and generally speaking, lower memory usage. Uh, also worth mentioning, 
there will be no more uh, distinction between lazy queues and non-lazy queues. In version two, basically all queues behave roughly like lazy queues. So basically we write everything to disk. That gives us much more predictable performance, latency, memory usage. And uh, since version one was released you know, 15 years ago, the disks got so much faster that it, there is no point optimizing for you know, not writing to disk uh, at any cost, basically. So in terms of memory usage, again, you know, yellow line um, version two, green line version one. Uh, this uh, graph in our Grafana dashboards is kind of upside down. So this is the maximum available memory and we are going down uh, to zero available memory. So just keep that in mind. But basically that means, you know, fairly predictable uh, low memory usage from version two. And more and more as we added, as I said here, we are talking about 25 queues, uh, 2,500 messages total. Again, the scale, you know, Grafana rescales the graphs based on the values that are uh, present. So we are talking about, you know, 10.2 versus 11 gigabytes, but, you know, roughly one gigabyte of memory usage here and, and much less for version two. All right, and back to David for some future developments. Yep, uh, so what would we like to improve in the future? Um, so one thing um, we would like to improve is um, support for MQTT and its uh, scalability. So today um, how it works is we have an MQTT plugin and this MQTT plugin um, receives messages via MQTT from some client and then converts those messages into um, AMQP, 0.901 messages, and proxies it um, to the channel. So there's some protocol conversion going on. And that's a nice mechanism to easily extend RabbitMQ's AMQP 0.901 core model with uh, support for more protocols. So that's how it's also done more or less for the Storm plugin, for example, or for AMQP 1.0. Um, yeah, earlier on, um, we said that creating Erlang processes is very cheap. Um, in this case, however, we create 22 Erlang processes per incoming MQTT connection. So it's a bit more complicated than what you see here on the picture. Um, so internally, it uses something called an MQP direct client. Uh, MQTT also has a um, quality of service zero and one. So zero means at most once, um, one means at least once. So for each quality of service, it creates a different um, channel. And then, um, yeah, we have already two channels on the client side of the MQTT connection. So this is in the MQTT plugin. Then two channels um, on the server side, so in the Rapid app. And furthermore, there are a lot of supervisors. And um, there's also a keep alive process in the MQTT plugin itself and some supervisors. Either way, so in the end, we end up with uh, 22 Erlang process per incoming MQTT connection. Now, MQTT is used um, in IoT scenarios. So let's say you want to um, have a million IoT devices all connected to your RabbitMQ broker. In this case, it does make a big difference. So whether you create um, 22 million Erlang processes or just a million Erlang processes. So what we would like to do is to have a single Erlang process per incoming MQTT connection. And we would like to not um, proxy anymore via AMQP. So we could achieve it by yeah, just routing messages directly to the queue. And uh, that's it. Now you could wonder why haven't we done it before. Um, so Carl developed a queue type interface. So refactored the core a bit, which allows us to implement uh, such optimizations. And this will achieve a much better scalability, much less memory usage. And we haven't measured yet, but should also so we did a short spike, but it should also um, give higher message throughput because there are just less message hops. So it doesn't need to hop through the channel process anymore. Right, another um, improvement is Capri. So another talk which was given early on by Deanna and Michael. Um, just to recap here very quickly. So it's a tree like replicated on disk database. It would be the new metadata store for RabbitMQ. So it stores um, queues, exchanges, permissions, users, and so on. And it's going to replace media for uh, in RabbitMQ at least. <laughs> um, it's meant to provide better network partitioning behavior than Minisia, but it should also provide um, better performance. So 
hopefully it's also better um, in the in its transaction management. So should allow for a bit higher um, churn, connection churn. Right, then something we would like to investigate is um, also continuous profiling. So um, Mihal was actually deploying RabbitMQ in Kubernetes. We have, we have a RabbitMQ cluster operator. So it's very, you know, two lines you can deploy RabbitMQ in Kubernetes. You can then install um, Parker. So Parker is a tool uh, for continuous profiling. It's also um, yeah, available on Kubernetes. And um, this is more or less, yeah, what you see. The uh, content doesn't really matter. The point is, you also get a flame graph. So they just inverted it, call it icicle graph. Um, but same thing, basically. The point, um, but the problem is that there's some Erlang debug symbol still missing. Um, so it doesn't resolve nicely. And sometimes you see some hexadecimal numbers. So you don't know what your function is. Now we don't know where the problem is. We talked um, to Parker. Could be some Erlang Parker integration, which is not working. Um, yeah, something we, we need to figure out. However, um, what we would like to do is to do continuous profiling of RabbitMQ in uh, production. So earlier on, the example which Mihal was giving, um, where we were doing a perf record of a single operating system process, which was the RabbitMQ uh, server process. And we're doing this in development mode. Now, Parker allows us to do some production with, uh, with minimal overhead and also to um, create this uh, flame graph for an entire RabbitMQ cluster, so across different nodes. And it also has a nice UI where we can diff different CPU profiles. So we see exactly between different um, RabbitMQ versions, which functions get slower, which function gets faster, or you know, for the same RabbitMQ version, but with different client workloads. And then, yeah, just a note. So sometimes it's not as easy as uh, what we explained, or what Mihal was explaining earlier on, you know, just create a CPU flame graph, change a single line and everything is faster. So sometimes the design needs to be re renewed. And this can take uh, sometimes even multiple years. Right. Any questions? Thank you, Mihan and David. So do we have any questions here? Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, how did you uh, reduce the memory usage of a uh, classic queues in classic queue v2? Um, I don't think there is a short answer to that. Um, Loic spent a lot of time, as I said, it's basically been a year and a half since Loic did nothing else than writing new version of classic queue uh, version two, and it's still not finished. <laughs> so, uh, you know, basically, the design has almost nothing to do with the old design, right? All the lessons learned uh, from the original design and running it in production in you know, thousands and thousands of installations um, fed into, into the new design, right? It's just a completely different design. It's not, you know, if, we, if we could just reduce memory usage, it would just you know, <laughs> improve version one, right? Like we don't need a version two for that. Uh, so it's, it's just a completely different design. I cannot really tell, you know, this specific thing led to lower memory usage. Uh, one thing that is certainly important is, as I mentioned, there are no more lazy and non-lazy queues. Basically, you can think of version two as always lazy, which means, you know, because everything is on disk, we can store less in memory anyway. Hi. Um, while you are ditching uh, the lazy and lazy distinction, do you intend to add in future tiered storage, possibly pluggable, like um, at certain limits, start writing to S3 or somewhere else? Mm -hmm. We discussed that for streams because they are you know, expected to store data for a long time and potentially a lot of data. So for streams, this may come in the future. For queues, I doubt it. Like, you know, <laughs> I think the goal of the queue is that you should consume that message as soon as possible. So, yeah. Uh, were, were you asking about streams or, or queues, perhaps? Everything but streams. Right? Okay. Any more questions? Okay. I have a question as well. So, you were saying that you changed classic queue to be more like lazy, right? But, um, 
fuzzy queues are kind of the in-memory queue solution right now. So yeah, I'm, not, I'm sure you thought about it, but uh, will there be a replacement for in-memory queues then? Or do you think basically classic queue V2 anyway is faster than V1? So let's mm -hmm. not worry about memory uh, access. That's basically the next thing that I'm going to look into. Um, Loic kind of finished what he wanted to implement and we are now testing how that behaves and we'll be comparing in the coming weeks how version two compares to version one in a transient message scenario. And then we'll decide what to do with that. Okay, thank you. Um, we have an online question as well. Do we want to, Ivan, if you want to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, we did. Uh, we are about to adopt uh, quorum queues, and we did some internal testing, uh, which showed uh, like you know, somewhere 10, 10 to thirty percent increase in CPU usage. So, is it something normal, or uh, like is it on your radar? Radar? Are you working to to further improve uh, CPU usage of the quorum queues? I'm not sure. I heard everything. Uh... I assume you're migrating from classic mirrored queues to quorum queues and have a higher CPU usage. Um, whether that's expected or not, I guess back to our you know slides and, and also what Gabor was talking about, without all the details, no idea, right? Basically, right? It's, it's just our, I, I cannot answer basically. Like we saw a lot of situations where or maybe the other way. We, foc we focus in our testing on data safety, latency, and throughput of those queues. If that takes more CPU to achieve that, you know, ideally it wouldn't, but uh, it's more important to have uh, you know, data safety and then good performance overall. Um, so you know, even if it turns out that it takes more CPUs to provide data safety, because it's worth to remember that classic mirror queues actually don't give you data safety. So yes, you're trading CPU for data safety. That's not a bad trade-off for most people, which does Thanks. not mean we cannot improve quorum queues, right? And again, going back to our slides, if you can give us a perf test command and show, you know, with this perf test command, I use mirrored queues, I see this. With this perf test command, I use quorum queues, I see that. That's totally something we can, have, we can look into. Thank you.